All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Art Talk. Uh, these are a series of conversations we have with artists who are currently exhibiting in the Mott Community College Fine Arts Gallery. And today's exhibition is Looking Back, which features former Mott Community College photography professors. And we are very lucky to be joined by Fred Cross, Robert Van Marder, and Bob Rentschler, all who have been extremely influential in this program. Um, this exhibit also includes Bruce Edwards, who was not able to be with us today. But we want to welcome all of you. We want to welcome our panel. So thank you for joining us. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. So uh, this is a pretty impressive exhibit. Uh, that we have in here, and it is always wonderful when you get photography up on the walls in this gallery space. So I have a lot of questions, a lot of things I want to know. I'm sure the audience, as we start to learn about all of you, will want to um, ask you some questions as well. So I'm going to start with you, Fred. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> it's always the person who sits closest to me, and I, 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 I rigged it. So. Can you talk a little bit about how the photography program got started here at Mott? Uh, <clears throat> well, Lansing had a program, and uh, the program at Lansing was doing very well. Um, this is a story I've been told. I don't know how factual it is. But uh, the uh, science and math department uh, was looking at their enrollment and thinking that maybe their enrollment was a little low. What could they do to boost the enrollment? The Science and Math Department already had a, a photography class on the books, but they hadn't offered it in a long time. Long story short, they decided to reactivate that program. I showed up uh, the Thursday before school started looking for a part-time job teaching photography Science and math did not have an instructor yet, and so they hired me. So the class was, was already enrolled, mm -hmm. nobody to teach it, nobody and to you teach. just, like serendipity, took over, and yes. there you were. Nobody to teach it, one in larger, and uh, what was the other? Oh, uh, one tank for developing film. 24 students in the class. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> So you yeah. developed one roll of film the whole semester in yeah. one print? Yeah. Is that what you did? <laughs> what, they, what they did, they gave me some vouchers. I went down to Big George's appliance store in Ann Arbor, uh, bought some enlargers, five enlargers, and tanks, and uh, came back, spent the weekend setting them up, and uh, we went from there. Well, you didn't have a dark room, did you? The uh, chemistry instructor uh, one of the chemistry instructors, Dr. Saturnino, lent us space. He had, a, he had a small room that he could use for research. He wasn't doing any research uh, at the time, and so he gave us th that space. And Dr. Wilson gave us uh, uh, a sort of a dark room. The geology lab had a, like a two-person dark room, okay? And he gave us that space. Uh, so we were able to take, uh, go from there. Uh, Chester Wilson went home that weekend, uh, built a trough for trays, right? And uh, off we went. That's incredible. So, so you taught that one class. So then what was the next? Stuff. I mean, you well, were hired as a part-time oh instructor, goodness. right? So yeah, I'm part-time. They had another part-time instructor. We offered uh, four sections, I think, four sections of the beginning class, 180. Uh, the next semester, uh, and people kept saying, you know, well, you've got to have more classes. You have to have more classes. And I'm looking at five enlargers and 24 students in a class. You know, what are you talking about? Gee whiz. Uh, but anyway, eventually we added more classes. We got up to, I think, four or five uh, different classes. And uh, I managed to do 
two semesters in a row as a temporary full-time instructor. After two semesters, it turns out they have to hire you permanently or you move on. And uh, so then I was a full-time uh, instructor after that. And what time period was this? Uh, this would have been 78, 79, 80 in there, yeah. And then how long did it take from that kind of offering some photo 180 courses before you saw the need to develop a full program? Well, <coughs> excuse me, we, uh, the school got a grant uh, from somewhere, I don't know. Anyway, uh, and my, uh, the person that was the acting chairman of the science and math department said, Fred, if you're ever gonna have a program, now is the time, there's money, you gotta do it now. And that would have been, oh my gosh, 1985, I'm thinking off the top of my head, I'm not sure. But, uh, so we did a need study and, <coughs> excuse me, we put together classes. I looked at Lansing and RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology and Brooks, uh, what do they offer? And I kind of tried to juggle those things together into a two-year program and went through all the committees and got it approved and, and we started again with not enough equipment. Uh, I bought four by eight sheets of foam core and some downspouts, uh, PVC downspouts, downspouts to make room dividers. So for if we're gonna do any kind of studio work, we would haul all the tables in the classroom out into the hall, oh. set up the room <laughs> dividers, and uh, we, need, we need more space, we need more space. Eventually enough students, enough space. Went to the RIT building and uh, as it that, continued that, to grow, right? And it just kept growing, yeah, 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 yeah. So, and continues to grow. These guys, right? Help. Yeah, I mean, at some point, I remember being a student here, and you, Rob, you were my photo 180 instructor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, my wife and I both were in your class. I think it was an evening class, and you liked her work way better than you liked mine. Uh oh. But I won't hold that against you. That's okay. <laughs> she was good. She was good. <laughs> so when did you join? When did you start teaching here? Oh, uh, I would say probably in the 90s, but I was off and on a little bit uh, in the 90s. Just, uh, but I taught at also uh, Washtenaw. I started there in '86. And then I uh, went up to Lansing Community College, and I would go back and forth. But it was about the time uh, Mary showed up here that I came here at that time, too, and things were kind of going gangbusters at that time, really took off. And that was probably uh, 95, 96 yeah. in that yeah. area, <laughs> right there when it really took off. So I was actually teaching at three colleges, making the rounds, which would take up my day trying to make it to class here just in time <laughs> yeah. and all that stuff. So it took quite a bit, plus running the business. But yeah, we were here. I was here when uh, Bruce was here. Dave was here. I think Nick, we were five of them. Nick, there were five of us. Here, yeah. there were five we'd of we'd so go 9 a.m. Yeah. to 9 p.m. every day. Yeah. yeah. We were yeah. booked solid with classes. Solid. That was great. Mm -hmm. A lot of fun. And then rushing off to the next gig Yeah. for you. I never yeah. understood how you managed all the different places you had to be. Yeah, well, it was tough. I, uh, first of all, I worked all the hard industry you can do in Detroit. I worked in foundries, steel mills, had all the really nice jobs by start out with weddings doing weddings because you can do that on the weekend but of course sunday you just recuperate sunday and it's time to start all over and so i did that for many many years used up my vacation holidays to do weddings then i went to uh, a foundry working in uh, aerospace firm and of course i got a job there in the photography department which was film uh, chemistry uh, and of course uh, they started video. That started happening, video and the cameras and stuff. But we did all that kind of stuff. And then I uh, started uh, doing corporate industrial on the outside. And so I wouldn't go on vacation with my family because that's when I do my jobs. Yeah. Or I'd you know, work around the clock 24 hours just to do it. And my studio was in my basement until I got wise one day and said, the heck with travel, I'm just going to do studio stuff. So that's what I started doing about 10. 
12 years ago, just small product studio stuff. And really, what was great is being in the middle of all that photography, doing weddings and all this stuff to this point, and teaching at the same time. Mm -hmm. They both fed each other. And I was like, there's not a better spot to be. You know, what I learned out there, I bring here. And I learned a lot here and took it back with me. I learned a lot from my students and everything. Yep. So yeah, that's where I went. And two years ago, I said, that's it. That's it. <laughs> Time for a break. Time for a break. Yeah. And here I am. That's awesome. And so, Mr. Rentschler, yes, you sir. were our previous past, present, I don't even know, <laughs> uh, program coordinator <laughs> program for coordinator. photography. Right. Right. So um, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started here and um, your experience? My, uh, my uh, teaching background, I won't go into how I got into teaching, it's a long story, a lot of my students know it, but um, I saw an advertisement. I had been teaching at the community ed level a basic photography class. I think I had taught four classes, one up at like Carmen Ainsworth, one down in Heartland or something somewhere, and uh, I was like, well, this is great, I really enjoy this, and uh, I saw an advertisement to teach one photography class here at Mott. So I got an appointment with Mr. Cross and uh, came up and showed him my portfolio. And um, fortunately, I managed to stuff everything I could think of in my portfolio. And he had asked me about, show me one day of work. So the good and the bad. So I had photographed a house, uh, really interesting cool looking house for an architect. And so I had all of my negatives and all of my contact sheets, thumbnails, big thumbnails for all you out there. Um, and I showed all of those pictures to, to Fred so he could see the progression of shot. So I started here, I went there, I went there as I refined my lighting and refined the angle of the shot or whatever it was. And that's one comment he made to me that he kind of liked seeing that, that he could see my growth in a confined space, so the living room. You could see five different angles of the living room and saw that you know, each shot got a little bit better or a little, looked a little nicer. And so after the interview, he goes, well, go down to this room down at the end of the hallway down there over in where personnel is, and uh, I'll tell them you're coming. And I was like, okay, I guess that means I got the job. I don't know. <laughs> it was just kind of like, so I just go, you know, I'd never been on campus before. I walked down this hallway. I turned and I go, hi, my name's Bob Rentscher. They're like, sit over there. Okay, here, fill out this form, fill out this form. And here, go, uh, go to this place. So they send me this place. And I go there and they cut a big hunk of my hair off to do the drug screen <laughs> test. And I was like, okay, I guess this is really serious now. I'm really going to be working here. So uh, I taught one class, and um, I, I, I loved it. I just had, it was a great time. Uh, Fred gave me some good feedback on my teaching, and Cheryl, my first dean, gave me some good feedback on my teaching, and uh, then Fred retired, and um, um, you know I interviewed for the job. There was a, an interim person in there for a little while, too, and then I interviewed for the job and got the job, and. 16, 17 years later, I decided to retire. You know? So it was, a, it was a great run. I, I miss you all. I don't miss anything else. I miss you all. So. No early mornings. You don't miss the late nights, making well, sure if, everything's prepped. If Heidi was here, <laughs> she's not here. Heidi is one of former students. She now teaches art and photography at um, Clarkston Schools. And uh, it was an 8 a.m. class, and I asked a question. I forget what the question was. And there was about four responses you could give to that question. You know, I'm being very general in their question. And um, it, it crickets. I mean, not a word from anybody in the classroom. So I got off my stool and went and sat on the desk. I was just like, you're not going to beat me. I'm just going to sit here and be quiet, too. So I sat there and sat on the desk and stared at everybody in the classroom for, I don't know, five or ten minutes. It was a long time. And then I pounded my fist on the table and I said, okay, we're done. You all leave. And they were stunned and they were like, look, I haven't got time for this. If you guys don't want to learn something and participate in class, I got other things to do. So leave my room. 
So I threw them all out of the room. I said, you can come back. If you want to come back, let's learn something. Let's have some fun. Let's be a class. So I said, you can come back in 10 minutes if you want. And then I'll know you're interested in learning something. So they all came back, and it was a wonderful class for the rest of the semester. <laughs> <laughs> so for yeah, so yeah, the 8 a.m. classes were like, get rid of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you could, right? As soon as oh, I could. Yeah, moving the I think I remember days. talking to you about it, too. I said, what am I going to do? This is like, it's, nothing happens at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I don't know, I didn't want to be there at 8, but, you know, it's the way it goes. It's your job, so you've got to show up. But. I wanted yeah. to start my classes at 7. They said no way. No, well, that's because yeah, you had so many other classes to get to. You had to fill it, fit it in your day. So, <laughs> so thinking, thinking of where you started, where it kind of progressed, how it ended. How do you, tell me about your thoughts on the industry of photography, being a professional photographer, the kind of things you've tried to impart to your students over the years. And is you've kind of already alluded, Rob, how the influence of the classroom affected you professionally. You know, how, how was that experience for you? Any of you? Anybody. Yeah. You're all mic'd, so you can all but talk yeah, over the, half of each other. You know, the, the, <laughs> the classroom is a great uh, um, opportunity for experimentation. Um, it is the place. It is the, the kernel. The, the where you can try things and see what works and what doesn't work and that's good for teachers and for students because really that's you know you don't want to make Rob and I've talked about this you don't want to make a mistake out where you're getting paid make the mistake in the classroom and then have have, have your instructors help you correct it that's where you want to make mistakes or ask questions uh, so that when you go out and are getting paid you, you're doing the right thing you're not going to get fired you know <laughs> I don't know. I, I love the classroom. It was, well, I think that's important, what, what you're saying right now. And I hope you're all listening, because I think probably one of the biggest challenges that I, a lot of us see today as we talk amongst ourselves, faculty, is that students are afraid to make mistakes. Yeah, they want to be safe. They, don't, they want to be yeah. safe. They're so worried about getting an A on the right. project or what that grade is. <laughs> the, the idea of play and experimentation is kind of missed. Tim, where's Tim? Tim back there? Tim and I were just talking about this the other day when I stopped in uh, with one of some of his students. It's, it's play, but play with a purpose. You know, that's, that's, I think that's really important. And then you find out, whoops, I had it at 85 degrees and it should have been at 80 and it didn't, I ruined the, I ruined the printer, I ruined the film or whatever, you know, but you learn something. So. So other things about your experience here, your teaching. Well, um, when I wanted to get in photography, uh, I thought I saw a wedding photographer. I thought, you know, eat, drink, dance, and take a few pictures and get paid. <laughs> Woo, you party! That's for me, man. <laughs> Who couldn't like that? As it turns out, wedding is one of the hardest jobs I've ever done. Yeah, it, it's incredibly difficult to do it. You have a lot of responsibility, uh, but I'm glad I did it. I'm very glad I did it, and it's very competitive today. But that's more opportunity for you guys. Sure. You guys have it way better than I had it. I use film, okay? And I did, I learned to do multiple exposures back then when nobody knew what the heck I was doing. And I still use those today in Photoshop uh, to, to make my image the same technique I used. So it still has to do with photography. But, it, but it's, it, that was a stepping stone to me. But if you're a good wedding photographer, you can make a good living being a wedding photographer. You can. Your heart has to be in it, you gotta work, but you, the rewards are there. And today with all the electronics and computers, the way to sell and everything, it's, it's made for you. You couldn't have anything better going for you than all this digital stuff today for work. So that, that'd be good. Um, so, so I did that. The other thing I like to talk about is I also did a lot of corporate work. If you look at my website, um, it's vanography.com. I chose that, sounds egotistical, but when I did Robert Van Marder, everybody just gave up, wouldn't die. It's too long of a name. So I thought Vanography, and it works. But anyway, that's what I, I've done recently. It's all product stuff. Uh, it's nice and neat and tidy, but I also think business is important. And you have to understand it is a business. Yep. If you take a business class here, it's good, but it doesn't touch on anything that photographers <coughs> need, because it's all about copyright. 
It's all about copyright. Your, your, your photos are protected in the Constitution, Article I, Section 8. It talks about how they're protected under copyright. And what many students don't know is when you make photographs for even someone else, it's your property. When I shoot a wedding for a bride and groom or portraits for anybody, they, I can sell them prints, but I own the image, the rights to the image. They own the rights to themselves, but I own the rights to the image. Wedding's just not that profitable. But for corporate work, I can sell and release that to many people many times as a stock image. If you give that away, it's gone forever. Yep. If you are in a class where you design websites, that website belongs to you. That's your website. You don't sell a website, you lease it. But they do lease everything to you. You're leasing Photoshop. So if you understand <laughs> copyright, and I've had to go to court right over here at the federal court on 5th Street, been there. Um, if you understand, it'll help a lot. So my recommendation was understand the business of photography, which is copyright, contracts, pricing, all this good stuff. And I no longer belong, but I did for years to a place called ASMP.org. Check it out. It's a good place to be. They come to schools. They help people. And they're going to be professionals that will tell you the truth. And so I went to a meeting, and they told me to bring my price list. Well, I'm kind of guarded in my price list. Why do I want to show you? Well, I went into the meeting, and every other photographer put their price list, their contract, and everything out there for everybody to see. And you know what the first thing I, I learned? Man, I'm really taking this in the hind end because uh, <laughs> I'm way under price. Oh, under Holy <laughs> God, no wonder these guys like me. That was a lifesaver there. So then I'm showing everybody my stuff. <laughs> Help me out here. That's what you need, and that's one of the few places you're going to get it. There's a lot of stuff on the Internet. Eh. But check a few good organizations around to do this. You'll learn. But my, my suggestion would be for most photographers, ASMP, and it will actually be a big deal to your life. It will help you tremendously. So. That's great. Mm -hmm. Fred, how about you? Well, uh, my story starts at the Chrysler Corporation. I was working there uh, testing cars, testing emissions uh, seven days a week, <laughs> uh, which really gets on your nerves after a while. <clears throat> anyway, after about two years of that seven days a week, I decided I couldn't take it anymore. <clears throat> and uh, started thinking about what would I rather do. And I decided I wanted to teach. Okay. Well, now I had to decide next, what do I want to teach? And I was taking photography classes in the evening, and it dawned on me, gee, maybe I'm interested in photography. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so I put the two together, excellent instructors that I had had, <coughs> excuse me, and my interest in photography decided I wanted to teach photography. I uh, went to Southern Illinois University, got my master's degree in photography, came up here and got a job. But uh, my real passion is, uh, or was, uh, teaching, okay? Uh, and that's a kind of hard for people to understand. They think I'm teaching photography. Oh, your passion must be photography. That was really teaching. You know, I really enjoyed it very creative, and uh, when I started here, like I've said, it was hard work, I mean, really hard work, a lot of extra time, and uh, it was worth it, and it kind of forced you to grow, you know. Uh, uh, so anyway, that's, that's my, my, where I'm coming from. I never worked as a professional photographer. I had other jobs where I qualified to be thought of as professional, right? And I found that the, the same attitude towards your work and the job carries over, whether you're an engineer or a photographer or whatever, <laughs> teacher. You know, that idea of being professional and taking your work seriously uh, is important, naturally. Uh, so, I did uh, come in contact with fine art photographers, people who sell their work, go to art fairs, that kind of thing, published in books, uh, 
And I discovered, much to my amazement, I guess, that these guys are working full time at this. Yeah. You know, mm. Howard Bond and Howard, Herbert. yeah. Mm -hmm. Every day, five days a week, he was either in his dark room printing, mounting, cutting mats, contacting people, writing articles for Darkroom Techniques magazine. It was a job. It wasn't, oh, gee, I think I'll run out in the woods and take some pretty pictures, and maybe next week I'll get around to developing them. You know, in the meantime, I'm going, you know, wherever. Uh, so that was kind of uh, an eye-opener, I guess you'd say. Uh, but uh, that's, that's sort of my story. Uh, you've got to be, wherever you're going to go, you've got to plan on working at what you're doing. Yeah. And there's going to be an intense competition uh, from everybody else that's trying to succeed and make a living at it, you know, naturally. So <coughs> that's, uh, that's where I come from, I guess. You have to put the time in. Yeah. You have to be willing to play and experiment right. Right. before you get to the job. <laughs> I always say you've got to wear out some shoes you yeah, gotta knock on a lot of doors yeah and uh, that's hard to do because you know we don't like rejection but you're gonna get rejected a lot now we got somebody thanks a lot okay bye here's my card okay, well see you later. right yeah. and I think yeah. Rob what you were saying too I mean like being a wedding photographer right like I, I could never imagine that responsibility right it's a one day one moment you miss mm -hmm. anything that's right. you yep. missed it right. there's no redo that's right. um, your film didn't yep. expose correctly, yeah. something went wrong, yeah. SD card failed now, right? Right. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of, you have to bring a lot of experience right. and effort into whatever you're doing, right? right? Practice. But it's a passion. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. So yeah. for all the photographers here today, right, following that passion, that's just part of it. Oh, yeah. 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 Hard work's a, uh, is a, is a part of it, but it's pleasurable work. And I, uh, right. I've always put in way more time than I'm required to. But in the end, that works out. And it's funny, but it seems like in just my later decade or so, it feels like I finally came into my own. Uh, I'm finally doing this. But I remember, I don't know if it was at school, but we were talking about a world-famous celloist who was 86 years old, and he was being interviewed. And during the interview, they found out that he still practices six hours a day, and he's 86 years old. And he said, why do you do that? He goes, well, I'm just getting good. <laughs> and, and he met it, and, and that's the way it goes. So I think it really never ends. Yeah. And uh, I said that I learn a lot from my students. I actually do. You talk to your students, they bring stuff out. They know a lot of things that other people don't know and stuff just by where they've gone. So yeah, it's all a thing. And the students I've noticed, especially up here, uh, they seem to work together in the studio and stuff, whether it's uh, uh, the computer lab or whatever, they all seem to help each other out. And that's really yeah. a good thing to do. And they just take it upon themselves to do that. So I thought that was kind of good, good too. So that's the part I like with school. No, the, the, this has been a great environment. I really enjoyed it. I love the, uh, the range of student that I had in class from you know, dual enroll students, you might get a 16 or a 17 year old, and then I always talk about uh, um, uh, Howard. Uh, he was 82 when he started. The so a gold card program. student, pot yeah. potentially, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that was really cool to have that range of, of student in the classroom. It was a lot of fun for the instructor. As, as Fred said, the education, the educational side of you, you know, you get to play back and forth on all these different personalities and experience levels and things of that nature and. Uh, I really enjoyed that part of it a lot here, and, and I think Mott fosters that, uh, that you know, college is for anybody, you know, kind of thing, and I, I always enjoyed that aspect of the classroom. So, it, you know, it was, I don't know what else to say, it was a great run. It was a great run. I, I really enjoyed being here, so. And we, yeah, we had a good team at the time. We did. We had a good team all the way through. We really did. Sorry, everybody. From the beginning to the get go, you know, we just had a good team. It yeah. seemed, seemed to work good there too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had a great boss. We had good organization. We had good uh, funding. We had uh, uh, you know good facilities, uh, things of that nature. We were able to get a lot of things done in a relatively short period of time, and 
that's just a lot of fun. You know? <laughs> yeah, you work your tail off, but it was a lot of fun. You know, it really was. So. so to kind of go into the next kind of, kind of series of questions, I want to talk about the work that you have up in the gallery, um, which I know we can't all see it right now. Um, you can in here, but those of you who are with <coughs> us um, in the live feed can't necessarily see it. But um, maybe talk a little bit about what you're currently focused on, what your current work is, um, and why some of these were the images you selected to share with us. Fred, tell me about this time thing. I I'm, know, I, right? This is really cool. It's really your time study thing. Thank uh, you, thank you. It's really neat. I was really, look at that stuff going, oh, that's really. So did, where'd you come up with the idea? What was the? Well, uh, several years ago, I, my wife and I were in Florida. And we went to a gallery, and, and there was a photographer there. Uh, his work was there. Uh, and I unfortunately don't remember his name, but he had some beautiful pieces. And one that stuck in my head, very large print, maybe five foot by three foot. Oh, yeah. Oh, big. Yeah, okay. yeah. And a, a young lady standing in, sort of in a woods kind of a setting uh, in a, in a, a dress uh, with blackbirds. She's holding a you know blackbird in her hand, and there's blackbirds flying around. It was a composite. Sure. Okay. You know? Yeah. And I go, oh wow, that's impressive. You know. Uh, so anyway, I got the idea in my head that I wanted to try doing some co composites. Right? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And I enjoyed Jerry Ulsman's work. Okay, composites. Composites. Uh, but I I couldn't afford to set up a dark room with five enlargers and all of that. Anyway. Uh, so I carried that idea around with me for quite a while. I tried doing one that years ago, several years ago, that came out okay. Uh, and more time goes by, and finally I decided, okay, I, if I'm going to do them, I got to get to it. Okay. Right. And so now I needed. I wanted to do a series. I didn't want to just randomly do stuff. So I came <coughs> up with the idea or popped into my head from somewhere. Who knows where? Uh, time. That could be a theme. Okay. So now I need specific ideas and the very first shot that I did isn't up here, but uh, uh, I've got, uh, it, it's a uh, shot of a metronome with the uh, Leonardo da Vinci's, uh, uh, the, the Vitruvian man. Vitruvian yeah. man, thank you. He's taped to a metronome. Yeah. Okay. And he's going back and forth like this. It's kind of blurred. Okay, so anyway, that was the first one. I thought, oh, okay. this is working out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really and, interesting. Uh, but to me, the fascinate, one of the fascinating things besides the image is the experience that I have creating them. You know, I, I'll pose a question for myself. Okay, I finished that print. What's going to be next? Okay. And some time goes by, and, you know, I might be driving or mowing the lawn or whatever, and <laughs> an idea pops into my head. Like my dad used to say, uh, um, where does the time go? Mm -hmm. That was one of his sayings. <laughs> been, where does the time go? Where? So I thought, oh, there's an idea for a shot, which is the bottom right shot over there. Uh, so I, I, my mind, I leave it alone. And it just starts building. And pretty soon I'm thinking, oh, you know, I can add a compass, so I can get a sextant, and I can do this, I can do that, whatever. Uh, and uh, enjoying that process and those little surprises that come along when you don't, aren't really thinking about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. uh, letting my mind incubate on the idea, okay? Very good. And, and spit stuff back at yeah. me, try this, try that. Sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. And I guess the other thing is uh, being willing to start over again. Make uh, mistakes. Yeah. Iterations, yeah, that's important. Um, you want to have an industrial strength trash can, okay? Yeah. This isn't working. Okay, I've got to go back to the beginning and start over again. Throw the rest of that away, right? You can't get so emotionally attached. Or be willing to say to yourself, yeah. 
that's terrible. <laughs> Throw it away. You know, we don't like we don't like to be that critical. Right. But, right. You know, and getting some of these prints yeah. right, I would still tinker with all of these that are up here yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, Am I 100% happy with every picture that I have up here? I'm pretty close, but I'd always want to tinker a little. I was telling you that mm -hmm. there's a you know a little edit mm -hmm. that I want to make on this one shot that I have here, and you know there's a couple yeah. things that I would do a little bit yeah, different. I think know. I think uh, I think I'm not sure. I think it was Michelangelo said, uh, "A work of art is never finished; it's just abandoned." So at some point you're putzing and <laughs> you putzing quit. and putzing and okay, I gotta stop. You know, I can go on fixing things, right? <clears throat> you know, for quite a while. But anyway, uh, that's where it's at, and and uh, I'm up. To, I actually have 15 of these things done. Oh, cool. And I think maybe I'm about ready to quit and try and move on to something else. So. So what's the new theme gonna be? Well. <laughs> I've been, uh, spirituality is, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's vague enough and there are so, so many possibilities <coughs> that it should be easy to do, or, well, relatively, <laughs> relatively, Conceptual. Conceptual. relatively easy, easy to, to do. do. Yeah. So when you're creating your composites, how are you doing that? You talked about the cost yeah. of everything, so okay. how are you doing it? Well, I start by making sketches, so I get an idea I've got a little notebook that I put sketches in for ideas. I sketch it out and continue to let my brain ponder. And uh, at some point, I was okay, you know, I need a watch. I need a, a hammer and a, and a clock and a, and a jar. That's what I want. Uh, I get on eBay. I buy stuff. <laughs> so I gather the stuff. I light it. I shoot it. Load it into uh, Photoshop. Most of them have our focus stacking images. Uh, I work on them in Photoshop, the individual images. Uh, put them in, I create a white canvas background, put the individual images onto the white canvas background, and then you can, of course, change the size, shape, uh, whatever, you know, Transform. Contra contrast. Yeah. Sure. Texture, so on. Uh, work on those individual pieces. Then I try to get them to fit into a decent composition, a decent design. And when I've uh, am close to what I had hoped for, uh, I quit. You know, and I print it, and <laughs> there it is. Does I did that answer your question? It right? did. Yeah. Okay. So you're doing like it. You're shooting studio. Then taking it into Photoshop right. and doing a digital process yep. to yep. kind of do digital darkroom. Yeah, print it, mount it, mat it, frame it. And the nice thing is, because of today's technology, if you ever felt like you needed to revisit it, mm -hmm. you can. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Easy to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. sure. Well, that's great. Yeah. So, Rob, how about you? Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Frost used some really good words in there. Uh, um, make you think a little bit. I thought I was the only guy doing that, but as it turns out, <laughs> I was like, too, but very, very insightful the way he uh, uses some nice, nice words and clues spit, spitting back at you. And those are the way we talk, but we understand that. Um, one of the things is I, I think he said he gets different ideas and so on, and he waits, you know, different ways he's inspired, but at the same time, I think that the technology sometimes drives your image. Because what can I do? Oh, look what this does, and it changes little minds. So you go here and there, and it right. pulls at you. Right. So don't be afraid of the technology to have a little bit of say, so or at least guide you and direct you. Or experiment with e it. Experiment right. with it and see what you're going to do. Because you guys got so much more uh, than we had with film. So someone today said, well, how old are these pictures? <laughs> well, Portrait. they recognize the style. It's film. But I brought that since I forget the term for us today. Uh, uh, they used to the heat from a time ago. It's it's there from uh, this is the early 90s, but what was there is I opened a, a studio. It was Glamour Boudoir, and actually she's my stylist, makeup artist, and here she is again, and this is a politician here, but anyway, uh, that's what they wanted. So we would supply all that, but once again, you know what? That's working with the public. Yeah. 
I had enough of that after five years. I got out of that. <laughs> the weddings was okay, but I'm in charge of the whole thing. So I didn't really like that, so I'm back into the corporate world. What I've done now is Photoshop is fantastic, folks. You've got to understand how wonderful it is. It's called Photoshop. Never forget that. <laughs> but it is not a substitute for good photography right. in the first place. I'm looking at Mr. Cross's work here. And he's starting out, his photography is great to begin yeah. with, because then, it, then it's just parts. So yeah. that's what's important. You can't disregard or, and just say Photoshop does it all, because it doesn't. Mm -hmm. At, they work together wonderfully, but you got it. They're different. So what I've done in these other ones with the bottles and so on here, uh, other than the motorcycle, is all those backgrounds really do not exist. When you have a studio, it used to be, I used to go have to go out and buy these products, bath mats and mirrors and glasses, and have people build these incredibly expensive sets for sets, them. Yeah. Time, it's time and money. It's terrible. Today, I can do that in Photoshop. I have these filters are in Photoshop. You just build what you want in there. So you can build reflections to look real. Uh, you can build little carts, uh, but you have to have that little intuitive, like Fred says, there's little stuff here and little stuff there. Mm -hmm. You can't let the little stuff go, folks, but it's all there. And it's another world, it's a dream world. Once you sit down at your computer, as you know, you look up and it's like 10 hours later yeah, or something, you're just having a great time. Two o'clock in the morning, how did that happen? So what I've said to myself <clears throat> is if I can shoot the product, such as a bottle or a pen or whatever, with no obstructions at all, because I shoot my things in space, like a pen, it's glued to a pole that you can't see. It doesn't lay down, because if it lays on something, you can't light it the way you want. Right. But if you put it in space, you get the best lighting. Now, what background do I want? Anything I can come up with in Photoshop and I use it. So other than the main product, all my backgrounds uh, are created. A couple of these have multiple exposures, which you guys learn in Photoshop. Learn to use multiply and screen for putting images together. It's going to make your life real easy. Okay? <laughs> it's going to make it fun. So that was about it. So these other guys are film, black and white film. You can see the grain in it and stuff like that. It was a nice time, but you had to shoot it right. There was no correcting it in Photoshop or any of that stuff, and that's where the pressure was. That doesn't mean you don't have to shoot stuff right. You still want to do the best job you can. Yeah. Yeah. But you have him. You know. You yeah. don't want to, when you're shooting, you don't want to be thinking, well, I can fix that in Photoshop. Right. Yeah. I right. can fix this in Photoshop. I can fix that. Mm -hmm. you know. Shoot it right Shoot to begin with. Yeah, you make yeah. it work for yourself. Yeah, have sure. good photography to start with, and that gives you the range of which then to operate off of. If, if your photography isn't good, now your range is narrowed. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't like limitations. Um, uh, being creative, um, you know, you, you want to look at something one day and do this, and then you want to look at it the next day and do this. Um, so I like having range. And having good photography um, gives you the opportunity to pull the range in any direction you want to go. But having bad photography doesn't allow you to do that. You, can't, you have to go and reshoot it. Well, if it's, if it's a location or a scene like a lot of my images are, um, can you go back to that scene in those atmospheric conditions again and get the exact same shot? No, it doesn't happen. Or it's extraordinarily rare. Or when you go into the Grand Canyon again. You know, I've been there once. You know, I'm, I hope to go again, but you know, it's that kind of thing for me with travel. So um, um, I, I tend to um, you know, hunt and look for images all the time when I'm out and about. And that's, where, that's the result of a lot of these is, is looking for something, um, or uh, you know, having a commission like the pastel sunset over there in the corner was for uh, good friends of mine. Well, we would, we would, you know, in conversation, we'd really like they, that shot was in Crystal Lake in Michigan, but they live outside of Denver, and so they told me one day, well, we'd really like to have a nice shot of the sunset on Crystal Lake someday. Put it in the back of your brain, and when you're available and there's the right conditions. I mean, when I, se I sent that to them out of the blue. They didn't know it was coming in the mail. I sent it to them and oh my gosh, they were just crying on the phone. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. You know, okay. But you know, you have to avail yourself of situations and uh, that gave me the reason 
to, to take that image. It's because I was going to give it to friends of mine, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, you have to be available to listen and, and look for situations that uh, uh, is going to be something that's, that's fun for you to, to photograph and capture and do stuff with. This, this shot of, all, of the Christmas lights on these trees, this is about a mile from my house, and this guy does this every year. But I could never catch it when there was a foot of snow on the ground right after a fresh snowfall. So that's like 2 o'clock in the morning. Just as the snow was dying, it was still snowing when I went there. But nobody had touched anything. I got fresh snow on the ground and finally got that shot. And I've been trying to get that shot for, I don't know, five years? But it was never the right conditions. I drive by there, I go, no. Drive by there, no. And then I don't know, it was midnight. And I looked at the weather, or I looked outside and said, oh, the snow's going to start tapering off. And I was like, okay, put on my warm clothes. I got to go get this shot done. And I gave the people that live there one of those images. And they were, of course, they were thrilled. And I got a big, long letter back from them and stuff like that. It was really nice. So I just, I see things, but I have to find the right time and the right atmospheric condition. I've always wanted to take this shot at the Grand Sable Dunes in the UP, but you got to be there when the sun is setting and it's got to be the right cloud situation and and you know i've been there three times and it's like eh, lousy get in the car leave you know it's like eh, nothing you can do but i got there and it was cloudy you can see the clouds on the left side of the frame and i was like oh but i set my tripod up and i sat there and, and then the sun starts to set and it broke underneath the clouds and i just was like Oh my gosh, this is perfect. I got the orange on one side and the yellow on the other side. And I was like, this is what I've dreamed about is this image, you know, to be able to get that. So, so, and so it was I, probably good you didn't jump in your car and just drive, drive away, away again, when right? I saw that it was kind of cloudy and not very good, you know, and I'm kind of racing to get there. I wasn't going too fast, but it's really curvy road, so you can't go too fast. But, um, and then I shot it several different ways while I had the time frame there, and that's a three shot panorama that I didn't correct the horizon on. I wanted to keep the curvature. I kind of liked the curvature of it. That was, that was kind of fun to have something different. You know, the bay, it really exaggerated the bay that's there. So I wanted to kind of exaggerate that, so I did it. I shot it multiple ways, but I really liked the three-shot panorama together, put those together. And again, Photoshop, you know, you can stitch that together. And I'll defy you to go up there and tell you where one frame starts and the other one doesn't. You can't. It's, it, yeah, it's 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 wonderful tool. It's a, just a wonderful tool to play with, you know. As I say, ten o'clock at night becomes two o'clock in the morning, like that, because <laughs> you're like, this is really cool. I can play with a lot of stuff. So, I'm kind of a hunter. I I look for images, like the the girls with the cows up there, you know. Um, set the camera up for shallow depth of field, uh, hand holdable shutter speed, and walk around and look for stuff, you know. But you got to be ready. And I knelt down, got real low, and the girl was grabbing the halter on the cow and click, you know. But you got to be looking for something like that in order to get it. Because you won't get it just kind of walking around. You got to be, you got to be kind of focused and, and really looking for images in order to capture them. So my process is a little different, but, you know, I, it, we're all still kind of the same. We still have ideas, and then we try to, you know, capture them. So I think, I think if you want to be creative, uh, one of the habits you want to get into is trying to be creative all the time. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a way of life. It's not something you turn mm -hmm. on and turn on. Oh, I've got my camera and I need to be creative. Zip, flip a switch. Nah. All the time. Well said. And the second habit that I think is good to try and develop mm -hmm. is... Uh, uh, um, Now I forgot what I was going to say. I'm sorry. I'm old. Uh, Practice or? Iterations. Good habits. I, but I, oh, I, okay. thought, I said that already. Shoot. Sorry. That's okay. So there were two, two ideas. It'll come back. I it's thought I'd turn it off. It's yeah, come back. It, it might. We'll see. There's always one in every interview. Yeah. <laughs> I turned it down. <laughs> I guess I just didn't dip, turn it down all the way. Anyway. Well, all right. Why don't we do this? I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. So, yes. Do you guys still have 
problems finding the correct settings and everything like that? I would so say it's not finding the correct settings. It's will the settings that I want to use allow me in this lighting condition to use them? Or do I have to do something else? Or come back on another day? Or because I know I want to do this, but there's not enough light, or there's too much light, or it's the wrong conditions, or whatever. So it's not so much you know, finding the right, it's fitting what I want to do in that situation. Did that, did that make sense? Yeah, that sure. makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, for all of these things, I'm, I'm, most of them I'm shooting in this, my little studio space. And I often use a gray card, take a reading off the gray card, and that 99% of the time, that gives me a decent, decent shot with you know detail where I want it. So you know, I just don't worry about it. And I also have my camera set <coughs> so that I get to set the f-stop and the shutter speed. The camera chooses the uh, film speed, ASA speed uh, that works with the shutter speed and the aperture that I have set. So I do it that way. Um, as far as uh, the, the correct uh, uh, sh uh, speed, um, I think it's more along, are you going to get what you want to get out of it? And you have to look and pre-visualize. You need to understand you what you're looking for yeah. instead of taking it and seeing what you get. And you say, well, I don't like this. But what's good today in my day with weddings, you can't make a mistake. Uh, Fred knows his metering really good, so he knows what he's going to get, but that's, that's learned. And so one day they came out with this thing called a Polaroid, an instant thing. And we couldn't wait to take the oh picture my in a camera. And now I can see before I pull the trigger or release a shutter, is this going to be good or is it not going to be good? That was limited. But today, you have that, your result right there on your screen. So there's your answer. If it's not what you want, do something about that. And that's what you want to do. <clears throat> Today's pictures are also a little bit different because of what we do. Uh, Bob may do it a little bit. I do it more in the studio. <clears throat> but many of these pictures, like Fred, they're not all done at one time. Right. Each, uh, it, look at all the different elements. Everything's a different element. Well, you can do that. I, I do architecture. We do architecture, lights like this. What if you wanted a sunset? Those lights don't blend. Right. So what you do is you take a dark picture of the building, let the sun go down. Okay, then when the lights come on, expose for these lights. Then turn those off, turn these on, expose for those lights. You're actually doing one image in many different shots. That's what I do in the studio with models. Can't do it with people, but if you have a product, a motorcycle, I don't do one shot anymore because you can't get that perfect shot. But if I do the, the tailpipe, now the fender, now the handlebar, now the headlight, 20, 30 different shots, each portion is perfect. Each is perfect. So, of course, you have to be at a tripod. <laughs> but, but that way, just think about that. You no longer have to settle for an overall shot. I don't do that. Everything I shoot is probably 10 or 12 shots to, to get it done. So you have that control, but that little window on the back is to let you know whether you like it or don't. I wanted to start off saying it's beautiful work, guys. Um, but my question is, do you guys, how do you feel about film making it it's way back in to like mainstream. How do you feel about film? Yeah, coming back to the industry. Oh, yeah. film in general. Yeah, coming, yeah. Coming back. Um, we were all film guys. We all, we all love it. But um, what I've seen and what I, I get the feeling for once in a while is uh, shooting some. Uh, medium or large format black and white once mm -hmm. in a while. I kind of still want to get into that, and that's partially because of Fred, and it's partially because of one of Fred's friends, Howard Bond, who's a fine art photographer in Ann Arbor, was one of my teachers. Um, yeah, I would still kind of like to do uh, a little bit of black and white film once in a while. And, and you know, not once a month, but you know, a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could really get into the minutia and the detail of working with black and white film again. Well, I really miss the smell of fixer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I like about. I miss that. I hated uh, the dark room. <laughs> uh, 
and I, and I remember doing this really well with oh, the yeah, film yeah, and yeah. all of Rolling that. Rolling film shit. into the. So I do miss all that. But man, what I used to do, what used to take me hours, is minutes. Yeah. So your yeah. productivity has gone from this to yeah. wow. Right. Right. Now, I was a film guy. I was probably the last guy they took kicking and dragging. I, I don't want to let but... it go. I wanna... <laughs> and then one day I just said, I got to do this. And you know what? I love where I'm at now. I just yeah. I, I do miss all that other stuff, but here's where I'm at, and that's what I'm really going. And it's just it's it's wonderful. So yeah, you're gonna miss it. I miss the look. I miss the feel. Some of this stuff here, but as far as productivity goes, it's really slow. Yeah, that's gonna be a thing there. So I, I think there might be in some classes and schools. Or I think there's a good understanding if you. Because you learn something about the image forming, there's still yeah. something magic about that. So if they had like an introductory class, I know some do to, to feel this. I think that's a good experience to get that feel of film and stuff too. Yeah. And that's what good. what Mr. Cross said about metering, getting your exposures right. Yeah. You you know film is unforgiving. Yeah. So metering everything, so you know what your range of contrast is in a scene, uh, became second nature for mm -hmm. us. I mean, you lived and died by your light meter on your right hip, you know, it was just, mm -hmm. and, and the better light meter you had, the better off you were, you know, so um, I think that was a good foundation, a good understanding, kind of like the basic drawing class was a good foundation, good understanding of form and shape and shadow and things of that nature, so, uh, like, you know, black and white film is still a good teacher. Yes, <laughs> well, I'm kind of the odd person here because, uh, I was never that crazy about printing the chemistry. Okay. I understand. And a lot of people really get up, got into that at the time. But I would say, <clears throat> you know, if that's where your passion is, that's where you go. Uh, and if you, can, if you can make a living at it, great. If you can't, then you gotta, you're gonna have to be creative and improvise and, and figure out a path for yourself. You know, but what I can do with the Photoshop and the computer is yeah. just way beyond what can be done with film. And I, I meet with people that, that shoot, you know, like eight by 10 negatives and, and a little bit smaller, maybe four by fives maybe, and they're in there with pencils, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Shading or shading, yeah. right? Shading <laughs> the negative or scraping the emulsion off the negative, oh, yeah. and that kind of stuff. It's Holy like smokes. <laughs> you know. I'm just it's like I jewelry just, work or something. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's really that's not me, but if it's you, terrific. Mm -hmm. you know, go for it. So uh, so Fred, you just said something about making a living. Yeah. And our dear um, friend from <laughs> online, Cheryl has asked, uh, maybe you could talk about um, how to get paid for your photography to the students. Go for it. Well, it's, it's, I, I would say in my almost 25 years of being a commercial photographer before I started teaching, uh, setting prices was probably, uh, if not, was second to the most difficult thing to do. Because you say you're $125 an hour to, I, I was at Chrysler on a contract for 14 years. You say that to them and they go, okay, start tomorrow. Uh, you say that to the little mom and pop machine shop that's in the industrial park. I live in Fenton. There's a bunch of little shops in the industrial park in Fenton. You tell them you're $125 an hour and they start choking. And, and so trying to find that, that happy medium of what to charge uh, based upon your clientele is, is, is difficult. Um, you know, if you always work for Fortune 500 companies or whatever, great, yeah, you're 125 bucks an hour or whatever it is. Um, and that's fine, but you know, you're working for uh, a small little startup company. I want, once took these pictures of this uh, adhesive sprayer to spray on adhesives in an, in an automotive environment to stick things to. And this guy was, was cobbling this stuff together out of his shop that was you know, about the size of this room. You know, so he doesn't have a lot of money. 
to uh, throw at his promotions. You, you need to promote. We all know that. But uh, you, know, you have to go in there and go, OK, so maybe I'm going to be $125 an hour, and I'm going to work for, I'm going to charge him for two hours, but I'm really going to work for four. OK, so you know, there's a lot of give and take in those situations. And I've had people, I mean, get angry with me with how much I was charging. And then the check practically beat you home in the mail, you know, because they understood that, hey, you know, see that, you know, I had a Dodge Caravan for years. You know, there's, there's $40,000 worth of equipment in that Dodge Caravan, and I had to buy it, insure it, and maintain it. So I don't make 125 bucks an hour. I got to buy all that equipment. I got to pay for the insurance. When it breaks, I have to get it repaired. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it was an expensive undertaking. Um, I flew, a, I did a lot of aerial photography in my career. Uh, I flew for 20 some years. And I had to carry a rider on a life insurance policy. Because if I died in the airplane, my wife wouldn't get anything because that's considered hazardous duty pay or hazardous duty employment. So I had to carry a rider on my life insurance policy. So you don't think about those expenses, but you have to expense everything out and really see where you are. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult situation. And, and demand your, your payment. You know, we were talking about that earlier, about weddings. Get your money up front. You book that day. You're, you can't make any money. If they cancel on you at the last minute, well, I could have booked that wedding. I could have booked another person for that wedding, so I just lost all this money. So you've got to get something. You know, so you, de you deserve to get paid. What was it? How did she word that question? Uh, well, how, how do you get paid for your... Well, how do you pay? Yeah. Well, there, there are different ways. Uh, when I started in weddings, uh, I got paid $7.50 per wedding. What? Per wedding. But what I was doing was I was being trained. And I made a deal. Said it, This guy said, if I train you, take about a year, for the next three years, you shoot exclusively for me. Because he's not going to train me to go shoot my own weddings or someone else's way. He's not going to be. So you sign that contract, no compete clause. Well, after three years, I was happy. I stayed working for him, but now I could get my own. So a lot of times, I've had people offer to pay me if I take them on weddings. I didn't do that, but I, you know, that, that's what you get. But so that's all I was getting. I was down river. It, it got eaten up in gas and everything. But in the meantime, I learned. So then I, I worked for them. There was a nice paycheck extra. And then when I started doing my own, you kind of feel what you want to do. Now, I didn't have a big fancy studio, so my prices were less. I sold a smaller package, but it worked fa dandy for me. Then when you go, it depends where you go. When you go into corp corporate work, that's a different story. What Bob said, you're starting in contracts and all that good Liability stuff. Liability insurance. Uh, every, everything. Yeah. Travel. And what they do is they pay you for rain days, sick days, uh, no one showing up days, driving days. You, there's a lot to it. You need to know a lot about it. So my recommendation is be an assistant. If you can be an assistant for somebody, even you say, I'll work for free, I just want to learn this. And many people at the top have done just that. You've got to yeah. take a step backwards before you can take two forward sometimes. And so that's the way you want to do it. But once you get rolling, that's it. But I do have some advice. Don't borrow money. <laughs> do not say, oh, I need to buy a studio and go into business. <laughs> Don't do that. You'll, you'll end up paying through the nose for that. I saved my $7.50 and from my other job to buy a camera during that time. And then you had to have all that equipment. So all your money in the first couple years you're not, you're not going to Disneyland or anything. It's going back into your business, and you're scared to death. After a while, you've got it solid. Then you can start taking a little bit. But it's not an overnight thing to do. Many different ways to go about it, but it is a business. So, yeah, I sold, uh, yeah. I sold a 1965 red Mustang convertible to raise money to buy equipment. Yeah. I did not want to sell that car. Uh, but, you know, look what happened. There you go. <laughs> so, it can work out, you know. So that was the only thing I had of value, and I needed I needed some better equipment. So, but I watched it drive away. I still remember that day very clearly. <laughs> well, I, I just want to make a, com a few comments. 
And I'm a film guy too, and uh, I took a lot of thousands of pictures every time we go on vacation with my family, and uh, scenic <coughs> and all kinds of <coughs> At that time, you have to go film, kind of expensive, so kind of limited. What I can take, a hundred, maybe a, a, a trip or something. And now I take hundreds and thousands, you know, because of digital over the phone, you know. And uh, so I want to learn more about it, uh, digital camera, so I got privilege to have Bob, uh, I call it cool fun guy, he always used a cool, it's a cool, it's fun, you know. <laughs> so uh, I, you know, for him, for my first digital class, uh, I learned tremendously, I learned a lot. I know how to set up some of those uh, uh, settings. I'm still learning, okay? Sure. And uh, so that, that's, that's great, you know. And then, um, believe it or not, I have the first official, non-official uh, uh, job, photography. And uh, the, de uh, the Mark Dental Hygienist, uh, they have a convention a couple, couple of weeks ago down the riverfront in Flint. Mm -hmm. And Mary, the one, you, you know, coordinating that, asked me, hey, you know, I know you're taking photography class, and uh, we know each other from a Seattle hiding club. And can you take picture for our convention? I say, well, I never done that before. I, you know, uh, no, no, you could, you know, the uh, Mark, uh, photographer, Mike, I think he's not available. He was doing something else. Sure. So he asked me to do it. Oh, gee, I really feel privileged, you know. They asked me, yeah. a student can able to do that. So I did that, you know, about six hours there taking picture with my new digital camera and take a lot of picture. Uh, so far, they haven't, you know, replied me back. I hope it's good. <laughs> I took about uh, 300 picture, got 200, you know, Find the editor to uh, uh, 200. I think sure. they are pretty good uh, sh uh, shot around the convention. All the students there and so far so on. And uh, another uh, thing you guys mentioned about the, the uh, Photoshop, okay. I signed up to second class of Photoshop 190. And uh, the you know, first two weeks, uh, you know, I sit there. I'm totally lost. And I say, <laughs> man, you know, man, this is a tough program to l learn how to use it. And uh, believe it or not, I did call the mission office, you know, I want to drop this class. So, well, I'm kind of late, you know, and we will not refund your tuition or anything. Sure. Yeah. And uh, you have to you know, say, I'm not a wasteful person. I say, I don't want to waste it, you know, the money. Sure. So I stick with that, you know, throughout the whole class. Believe it or not, at the end, we have an a exhibition for the student mm -hmm. artwork. I want to uh, award. Very good. Yeah, one from uh, Dr. Bradley, he bought one of the pictures sure. from me. The, yep. It's a Photoshop pictures too. And uh, also Dean Guru bought other pictures too. So, okay. uh, you know, <laughs> I hope you follow me, you know, took your class and sure. I learned tremendously by doing Thank that. You. And Photoshop is a tough, tough class to, to do, you know. Right now I'm taking 2D uh, design right now. And uh, the okay. couple of classes I have to do in order to finish the, the uh, professional so, uh, photo photography certificate, okay? Sure. Photos are 192. I think that's the last class I'm going to take. I want to sum up all the energy so I can handle <laughs> that, you know. But the other one is, is uh, I think, soon, okay, I got a few more classes to go. So oh, uh, I, thank you very much sure, for your, your you know, uh, teaching and knowledge and all your set up the program, it's just, just a fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. What um, a great endorsement. Ba back to um, um, <coughs> uh, the expense and, and things of that nature. Um, you know, we all had uh, extra refrigerators at home. It wasn't for beer, it was for film. <laughs> um, you know, because you had to buy, uh, so when you, when you look at expenses of things, you know, we had to refrigerate all the film and uh, and paper, your, your photographic paper for in the dark room. And you had, if you were doing things in the dark room, you had to have chemicals on the shelf ready to go. Mm -hmm. Now with, with digital, right, what's, what's the issue? Well, I just bought a new laptop the other day. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm retired. You know, <laughs> I don't want to spend that much money. I, I actually found a really good deal on something. But you know, you always have these expenses because this is the process that you're in now. You have to be able to, um, you know, if you're going to do this, you need 
you know, moderately decent equipment. And that involves a computer and software and, you know, all, all, all of these uh, peripherals to help you with just a yeah. camera, you know. So. Yeah, but you want to be careful <laughs> reading reviews. I've noticed that about <laughs> myself. You start reading reviews, you know, stereo equipment or photography equipment, whatever, <coughs> and pretty soon you get this idea in your head, oh, I've got to have a new camera. I've got to have the new lens, the latest lens. You know, if, if you're satisfied with the work that you're getting out of what you got, those are the best pieces of equipment in the world yep. right there. You know, mm -hmm. stop, right? If you're not happy, then figure out what do I need if I what do you need what do I need to buy to get where I want to go what do you need to do the job you want right, to do right right, right. so anyway so I wanted to ask you um, would you say for a student that maybe doesn't have a strong interest in photography currently what would be a reason for that student to take a photography class look around you. I, no, I, I don't mean that. I don't mean to be so flippant about the answer, but look around you, right? We are, we are, are never more consuming of media in a society than we are right now, right? If you're a business, you have to have four or five different social media platforms running all the time. You must have an up-to-date website, and you must refresh it or upgrade it or whatever the term we use now um, regularly because you can't have stale content because what happens I already saw that what's next right so in terms of uh, visual things um, it's it's a great time to be a creative because everybody needs you it's just how are you going to approach it and where are you going to go and what's the job going to be and what's the scope of the job. Um, are you going to have to wear three hats or five hats, right? Um, are you going to have to write mostly in this job and then photography maybe five days a month? Well, then you should probably concentrate on your writing a little bit more mm -hmm. so you can support the two. In fact, I was just asking Alicia about an assignment she has for the photography students and I said, do they have to write a paragraph and a headline for the photo? She says, oh, yeah. And I was just like, good job, kid. Good job. You're uh, doing fine. <laughs> uh, another thing might be just the sheer pleasure of it. Um, sure, good point. There are, anybody can take a picture. All you need to go is click. But to make a photograph, that's different. So a lot of people could take great, have had beautiful pictures. But if they were asked to do that again, they couldn't do it. Right. So when you make a photograph, it's what you want and you'll get that sense of accomplishment. Um, and for a student starting out, if you were to try that, that would be your first class would let you know if you like it or if you don't. But there's a reward there. Um, the other thing is, if you have already have an interest, there's something you could do, such as one of my students, well, a lot of them do, but a couple of them uh, train horses. They have really nice high-end horses and stuff. Uh, she, I told her what to do. What can I do with my photographer? She takes a picture of your horses. She sent it into a horse magazine, equine or whatever they are, uh, equestrian or something, <laughs> uh, magazine, and she got an article, a whole article with pictures of her horses in there. She was tickled as, as heck, and that was just her first class she ever took. So you can do, do things like that, and it, it's an enjoyable thing if you like that type of thing. Yeah, I always look to combine when you can. It was one of my professors at Western Michigan University who so told me, Bob, what are you going to combine this with? How are you going to take this and this and put it with that? How are you going to put it together? And I'll reiterate, another one of our students uh, has two boys that race motocross. Oh, yeah. And she went to the ice racing nationals up in northern Michigan. She was the only person there with a the camera because it's winter and nobody wants to be out. Yeah, she right took a right bunch there. of pictures. <laughs> Right? And she knows what she's doing. She got good shots. She knows where to be in the corner to get the right angle and the ice flying off the tires and, you know, the good and dynamic images. She's now working for the American Motorcycle Association, doing their magazine, writing the articles, traveling all over the country on photographing motocross and racing mm -hmm. every week. Mm -hmm. She travels, goes to races, photographs, and writes. She's unbelievable how it happened. 
So it can and does happen, but you have to be ready and prepared and do good work. And I mean, she was sending me things. I don't know what to charge. They want to put me on the cover next month. And I was like, okay, then now we're in business. Let's talk about this. You know? So yeah, she texts me regularly and it's a lot of fun. So. And you want to keep in mind that what's happening right now is you're just feeding yourself on your experiences. <laughs> and you have no idea where you're going to be five years from now, you know. So if you think you enjoy photography a little bit, do it. It's here. You've got it in your soul, right? And, and if, if you need it in the future, you've got it. So you're just, you're just putting, it's sort of like putting money in the bank or investing money, you know. That's how I see it. You're how old? Okay. I missed it. How you're old? Not, you're not 45. <laughs> no. <laughs> you can still do that at 45. Well, sure, you right? can. <laughs> <laughs> just just sure you disclaimer, can. disclaimer. There is no right, age right. limit. But, <laughs> there, <laughs> but I'm saying you have, a, you have a little time on your side. That's what I'm saying. But, you know, you got to, I mean, you know, you need to have a certain amount of financial security in order to, put food in your tummy and a roof over your head, right? We all get that. But other than those basics, you know, there's, there's, there's being happy. And, uh, you know, yeah, at times I made really good money. At times I didn't make a lot, and it was difficult. And I took on side jobs, and that led me into teaching. And then I ended up here. So, you know? <laughs> so we have, let's go. A couple things here, Bob. When you said when you first came here, you know, and got your um, enlargers and stuff, was that strictly, was it color and black and white, or was it just black and oh, white? Just black and white. It was just black, black and white. white. Yeah, I was back in that same round time, the mid '80s in high school. <laughs> I lived in Southern California, mm -hmm. and I was able to have I had two and a half years of, of photography, and we had, well, we did actually both. It, we, mm -hmm. The majority of us stuck with the black and white. It was just easier compared to, to color and stuff and, and really learned a lot. With that being said, and then I just sort of, after high school, for whatever reason, just sort of forgot about it and it was TikTok craze and watching photographers on there and sort of got that bug in me again and then so I decided, you know, I want to take some class and stuff <coughs> and then get back into it, yeah. which we're actually next semester have a black and white class we're going to be able to take. I'm really excited to get back in there and in the dark room and just sort of relive, relive that too as well. And another question is, for us, a lot of us being first, you know, beginning photography, where did you realize that, okay, I know enough, now I need to, I want to get paid to do this, and get that confidence, or, or is it something that you saw, you know, you just listen to other people, you know, or how do I make, me and myself being a little bit older in, in this business, do I get, you know, I, and I've been helping out with the, um, sports department here, taking pictures of basketball sure. and stuff, send them to, to Al and, and the post and stuff. Now, where do I say, okay, do I just, let, you know, feedback or to where I say, okay, maybe I can do this for, you know, start getting paid to do this and whatever. I just don't feel, I don't have that confidence yet. Where did you guys decide, okay, I'm ready to get paid for it? Um. <laughs> When I started with wedding, first of all, it's a scary thing. Being it in is. business for yourself, it is. it's a scary thing. Oh, yeah. The rewards are there. Um, <laughs> as I said, weddings didn't turn out like I thought, but they were the hardest job I ever had. But at, and I worked in a foundry at the time. I'd work in a foundry 10 hours and go do a wedding. And I was wiped out. But to be honest with you, the best feeling of satisfaction I've ever had was after I did a wedding, because I knew I did a good job. I worked as hard as I could. I get out in the car and take my tie off, and that was the best, best reward right there. But on my first wedding, I'd been trained for a year. The phone rang for my boss, and he goes, well, when is the wedding? And they said, in 20 minutes. <laughs> and he says, you want to do it? And I went, OK. So I take off. I go to my first wedding, get all my stuff under my eye, walk in the door, and I saw the cake and the bride. I chickened out and went back in the car. Whoa. I was scared to death. I goes, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And I said, you know what? If I don't do it, it's all over. It's all it ain't over. gonna happen. Right. And I went in and did it and 
whoosh, it was only 20 minutes, but I was scared to death, and I, all by, I was only 19, 19 years old, mm -hmm. had to do that on my own, and I did it. Then after that, then you start getting a smaller way, then all of a sudden you get a little attitude, yeah, I got this, man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 but it takes time to do it. When I opened my studio for the, the portrait stuff, I didn't just decide I'm going to do this. I practiced for a year doing this, offering models free photography if you'll pose and all this, put all my money into it and created a package before I could go do it. And that's how it's going to be. It's not going to be all of a sudden <coughs> I'm here. It's going to be a little at a time and then you'll get a feel for it and you'll go. But in today's world, you've got to communicate. And remember, you own those images unless you sign it away. And you do that by being a full-time employee, and when you are a full-time employee, whoever you work for, and it requires a lot to be an employee, they own the image. Other than that, you own it, but if someone says, we want to buy them outright or whatever, and you say, and you can, no. you should ask for more, but then you don't get any claim to them, and some images are worth money, such as maybe football pictures. If you shoot those guys, but I'm going to guarantee you right now, U of M will never let you take them. They ain't going to let that happen. Right. So you have to They're make that decision them. unless you're a freelance or something. But when you're on your own, you want to keep that as much as you can. You just start a little at a time, get a feel for your mistakes and where you're going. It'll take you there. But there's no magic pill. With that being said, if, if us photographers are posting pictures on the social media, is those still ours or is it now everybody's? <laughs> no. See, they're, they're, they're trying to confuse us. They say because of the new digital age, that changes copyright. No, no, it doesn't. Stealing is stealing. Yeah, I don't care how you do it, it's stealing. And so, so when you so agree you own to right a to, digital platform. If you agree to it, yeah. Right? Does anybody ever read the terms and conditions of any of these digital platforms? You no, should. none of you have. No, that's right. Excuse me, you're foolish. Because yeah. <laughs> knowledge is power. Right? Uh, so read them. Even if you disagree with them, read them so you know. Because a lot of these digital platforms, they own everything. You have no right to it. So I, I don't think I've put up a full res image ever. Because somebody will take it and use it for something. You know, they'll take the lightning picture. Lightning strikes here, whatever, I, you know. You know, so I, I don't think I've ever put up a full res image. I JPEG them way down, like a three or a four. You can still, that looks, still looks nice but you can't blow it up, so. If I could touch on something here, one of the students asked about, uh, was money or stuff, but I talked about shooting what you want, you know, like if you're into horses or knitting or cooking, take pictures of your food. Uh, if you're into family thing, take pictures of your vacation, always make a vacation story, uh, do that, that type of thing. But here's something else, you know, you guys are gonna learn photography and it's gonna direct you, but you're gonna have a favorite thing you like. Since those are your images, you save them because they're what's called stock photography. Mm -hmm. And you, that's your image and you have that, you can lease it to other people. Now, if, if a corporation pays you to take it and they don't buy it, because they only need it for one annual report, then they're done. After they're done for a year, then you can sell it to other people under a generic term, generic name, and you should do that. So there are companies out there called stock companies, because They'll take the image, but they don't want to pay for you to shoot it all over and start. You just got something generic. There's your extra income. Mm -hmm. So if you save that, then you have an easy way to market it on any website. Say, I live in Michigan, and I live, uh, I, all, I do all these trains that go by my house. Well, somebody's interested in trains out there. Somebody's interested in palm trees, clouds, bridges, different things. So you find out something you like, flowers. You save that, that's your future future income and let people know you have them and you can start selling, make some money that way too. Your internet's your greatest tool. Huh? Yeah, it won't be a lot to start, but it might be, yeah. you know, significant amount in 10 or 15 years. And you have to aggressively market. Yeah, you can't right. just, yeah. just put your sticker out there and do it. You gotta, you gotta push people. You gotta say, hey, I got a nice job by going to a drag strip. I see all these big drag racing, they take nice pictures, but I didn't see any really good photography. Yeah. Sorry about that, but that's the way I went in. 
I said to the, the person that owns this drag strip, I said, here you're getting these shots from the NHRA and all this stuff, and they're good, but they're not really cool. Look at this. So I showed him some stuff, and I did get some killer images. Uh, but it's a dangerous place to be, trust me. <laughs> it's a dangerous place to be down there. I had jet cars and everything. But I was doing that for a little while uh, and making some money off some of that too. But then I found out I have to go on the road and do that again. But so that's how you have to approach. So I went into to these people said, you know, these are good photographers, but they're not giving you this. I can give you this. And that's how you have to go because they're not going to come to you. You have to go ask for the work and tell them why you're better. Yeah, I've gone into businesses and said, look, at, here's the deal. I'll, I'll shoot this piece of equipment or I'll do this job for you for free. If you like it, you got to pay me. If you don't like it, you'll never see me again. And that, you know, but that, you know, it takes guts walking in the door and confidence. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> I remember when you talked about your first First job, I had been shooting for a number of years on my own, and I had to do this, this food shoot uh, for a company. And I remember clearly to this day being in the bathroom of the house because it was the president of this company. They have Chicago hot dog. They have uh, restaurants in, in airports and things all over the country. This is a multi-million dollar operation. And I'm being in the bathroom of this lady's house with my ad guy I was working with, and I'm putting cold water on my face, looking in the mirror, going, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> but you, you rely on your basics, and you figure it out, and you rip a bunch of Polaroids, because I'm stalling for time to be creative. Yeah. You know, I'm waiting. OK, when's this going to hit, and I'm going to start getting this right? You know, so, oh, the light's not right. The light looked fine. I moved it six inches, you know. Oh, it's still not right. I moved it back six inches, you know, because I'm just, you know. <laughs> You got to be creative with your time because you know I'm like oh, this isn't right. Oh, this isn't working. Oh, this isn't. Oh, oh, there it is. Oh, that looks good. And then you're off and running, and I was fine the rest of the day, and I made a lot of money that day. But, but I remember very clearly being terrified, as he said. I didn't go back to the car, but I, I stood in the bathroom for a while, splashing cold water on my face, going, oh, oh boy, what did I get myself into? You know, because you can't let everybody down. You know, you'll never work for them again. And that was a potentially really good client, and they were for many years. So, you know, <laughs> we've all been there. So, you know, it's not all just like that. You know, so. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time this afternoon, for sharing your insights, your wisdom, your mm -hmm. experience throughout the years here at Mott with all of us. Thank right. you very much. All right. So, thank yes, you. thank you for today. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, this exhibition, if you want to see it without the lights and out all the chairs and the space, it'll be up till the 22nd of November. And we hope you'll come back and join us for our next exhibit, which is called The Next Steps, which will feature our Studio Art AFA candidates exhibiting their work before they graduate here from Mott. Um, that will open on December 4th, and we hope you'll come back to see that. So again, thanks to all of you. Thank you to Brian Williams for Media Services hey, and the Brian. whole hey, Media Service team for all they do to make these possible. And again, thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Be glad to hang around for a little bit if you want. Yep. We'll be here.